Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel, Fred. Douglas McGregor asserts that the genesis of every significant crisis or conflict in U.S. history typically involves a collective forgetting. He points out the tendency to overlook the necessity of thoroughly understanding the regions of operation and the potential adversaries involved. He criticizes the lack of regard for others' interests, particularly within Washington and the globalist circles in Europe, including Germany and France. According to McGregor, these entities prioritize ideological objectives aimed at undermining the Russian state, which refuses to conform to Western demands of open borders and relinquishing its national identity. He describes this as an attempt to integrate Russia into Western financial and military dominance. He raises an important point. Somewhere along the line, someone must have had some sense and questioned the true objectives. The objective seems to be to harm Russia, to bring down Putin. It brings to mind Antony Eden in 1956, during the Suez Crisis. He told Field Marshal Montgomery, who may have been the chief of the Imperial General Staff or perhaps retired by then, that they were going into Egypt. Montgomery questioned why, for what purpose. Eden's response was to knock Nasser off his perch. Montgomery found it absurd and questioned how they planned to achieve it and what they aimed to create in the country. Chaos. Civil disorder. It seems they wanted it to disintegrate, which are real possibilities based on what was said. Let's set aside whether it's actually attainable. Why would the rest of the world allow it? Obviously, Antony Iden's concerns fell on deaf ears, and they pressed ahead in the sewers, resulting in disaster. They were unprepared, didn't understand the situation, and grossly overestimated the Egyptians. They failed to prepare groundwork, lacked a plan, and didn't understand specific objectives other than wanting to remove NASA. Similarly, today, we seem inclined to see Putin as a Stalinist and the Russian army as another Soviet imitation, which is all wrong and makes no sense. Behind it all, there seems to be a group of wealthy individuals known as oligarchs in the East or hedge fund billionaires who have an interest in gaining access to Russia's vast resources. Anything they can do to bring down the regime and fragment the country is, in their estimation, financially rewarding. That's a sick notion in my judgment, but I think that has also played a role in all of this. And then remember, we Americans don't pay much attention to what happens overseas. Unless you kill 1,000 of us on a particular day somewhere beyond America's borders, Americans don't pay attention. This has been the problem for 60 years. It's disastrous. I don't think there's much. If you go back to an interview that I did with Dimitri Sims in January, actually, I think it was his co-host, George B.B., former CIA officer. It was in January before this whole thing got started, and they were asking people to make predictions. Well, one of my predictions, like so many others, was wrong, and that was, I said, the Russians absolutely go in. I was correct. I said that by the time this is over, NATO will collapse. I said that in January of 2022. The one thing that I got wrong, and I think a lot of us did, was that the Russians would go in as carefully, deliberately, and slowly and cautiously as turned out to be the case. Of course, we were not on receipt of the Russian general staff's instructions from the president and Putin, who really didn't want a war. Who is really trying to do something that you should never do as a head of state, which is, quote, unquote, send signals. He was trying to signal the West. He had no idea how corrupt and ventile of the globalist elites dominating Europe and the United States really were, and how absolutely outrageously hostile they were. I don't think he ever anticipated that. He thought that once this got started, that people would stand up and say, look, we don't want a war in Europe. I remember when I was an officer in the 1990s, the 1980s, but specifically in the 90s, and then along came the coastal air campaign. I stood around talking to some of your colleagues in the Dutch forces, as well as the Germans and the French and others, and they all said privately, we thought NATO existed to prevent the outbreak of another war in Europe, not start one. Well, welcome to reality. This has been engineered by Washington with support from London and Paris, and the Europeans are going to pay a terrible price. The sooner they wake up to this reality, and frankly, I think, throw us out, the better off they will be. But that's an issue for them to resolve.
No, I understand. And the thing that's so disturbing to me is that no one seems to care. I know that no one in Washington cares whatsoever. Now, I grew up with Ukrainians in North Philadelphia. I loved them. I thought they were great people. Yeah, they also grew up with some Poles and Lithuanians and others. I was the odd man out because I didn't fit into any of those categories. But that's one of the reasons I ultimately went to Europe to study in Germany. I was so enthralled by the people that I met, and they were equally enthralled with the Germans. And then I became interested because, of course, at the time, we were facing the Russians. So I was trying from the very beginning to understand all of these individuals and all of these people. I'm not sure I ever completely grasped it, but I can tell you one thing with absolute uncertainty. No one in Washington understands any of it. Well, the government in Warsaw has been very hostile to Russia from the first moment, and they are caught up in this emotional hysteria that on the one hand, Russia is evil and any Russian has to be destroyed. Employed. And on the other hand, they see themselves as the inevitable imperial masters of much of Ukraine. And Bill, I think that's falling apart right now. In fact, I received some information this morning from my friends in Poland telling me that 52% of Poles have now essentially said, we want nothing to do with the war in Ukraine. Some say, well, we'll send support and assistance, but our real interest in Poland right now is to get millions of Ukrainians out of Poland. So that's a big change. So I think it's, it's going to be very hard now for the Poles to be an American stalking horse, because effectively, that's what we tried to do with Ukraine. They were a stalking horse. Let's push and push and push. See how far we can go to the border with Russia, and if we can put troops and missiles and equipment out there in the east that will threaten Russia. That's a good thing. Then we can bully Russia. We forgot we weren't dealing with Iraq. We weren't dealing with any of these artificial constructs as opposed to real nation states. Russia is a real place. So you know now we're paying a terrible price. But I think we're learning, and I think Americans are learning because they look and they say, we have so many people in the United States who need help and support. Why are we sending billions to Ukraine? It's a very simplistic formula, but it's working. He has always said that Kharkov and Odessa would once again be Russian cities, so I think that will happen. There's no question about that. I think at the same time, he's watching to see what the West is going to do. He sees votes in Berlin in an extremely fragile position. Scholl says that approval rating of about 31%. The German electorate says it wants a new government. I think the Germans have finally discovered that they're not only headed into a deep recession, but they're being deindustrialized. Their scientific industrial power is being destroyed. And again, the Germans are saying, well, we were never really consulted or no one asked us whether or not we wanted to declare war. Instead, you had all these emotional outbursts from this woman, Angela Merkel, who is absurd, who refused to shake the hand of Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister. It was just childish nonsense. And all this, Moscow was watching and saying, well, how long before Scholz is gone? How long before Macron is? If they can get rid, I'm saying the Europeans, if they can get rid of those two then I think you may have some governments that will come forward and say that's enough. And there. Then you have Washington, and Washington, and Washington is stuck in a swamp of its own creation. No one wants to retreat from ridiculous statements and policy positions. No one wants to step forward and say, this is a real mistake. By the way, we lied to you, and we've been lying to you for months. You know, right now, there are 37 Ukrainian brigades. We think roughly 37 all along the defensive line from the south, say, I would say to the northeast. We think the Ukrainians may have six brigades in reserve. 64 brigades amount to what? 24,000? A little over 100,000 Ukrainians sitting in these defensive positions where obviously they are being hammered on a routine basis, and dying every day. At the same time, the Russians had 300,000 troops in reserve and Putin has always been reluctant to commit that reserve and bring this to a rapid close because he's afraid that we will then suddenly convince everyone in NATO to go into western Ukraine. And if that happens, 
then he's got a war in his hands, and he really never wanted. But he is then compelled to win it. He can't back away. He can't allow this Trump state that may emerge from this experience to be part of NATO. You know, from the very beginning, Ukraine should have been neutral, had no business being part of NATO. He knows that. So I think it's really a matter for decision by Vladimir Putin, and I think he's watching all of these things before he commits forces. Then lastly, and I know a lot of people don't believe this, but this is true, he doesn't want to kill any more Ukrainians. No, he knows that those F-16S without airborne warning and control systems, these are the aircraft with the extraordinary communications capability and radars. They're the ones that target for all the aircraft. You're talking about a very complex operation, so that this is not going to arrive. Before this comes to an end, in my judgment, it's not going to change anything. I think it's very foolish. 